my greetings to all my respected teachers, colleagues, and seniors. Uh, our today's topic is uh, renal replacement therapy in a refractory shock, the strategy and clinical implications. I will be dividing this discussion in the introductory part, the basic definition, the CRRT itself, and the ongoing discussion. <clears throat> So acute kidney injury uh, affects almost 60% uh, of the patients in the uh, critical care setting. It is associated with the mortality rates ranging between 15 to 60%, which is uh, quite high. Up to two thirds of the patients with the uh, acute kidney injury uh, go on to the requiring renal replacement therapies. Uh, then uh, coming to the today's topic, that is the refractory shock. So basically, uh, it is defined as a persistent hypotension with uh, end organ dysfunction despite fluid resuscitation, high dose of vasopressors, oxygenation, and ventilation. So, what is the pathophysiology of the refractory shock? So, it's a central pathophysiological feature in refractory shock is the impairment of the vascular response to catecholamine stimulation. There are changes in the receptor signaling, metabolic derangements, and uh, depletion of the endogenous vasodilatory hormones. The inappropriate vasodilation typically occurs from the effects of inducible nitric oxide synthase, that is INOS. Uh, many patients with the shock, septic shock, uh, do suffer from acute kidney injury. The classic uh, KDGO guideline, uh, KDGO definition of the AKI defines AKI as the increase in the serum creatinine more than 0.3 mg per deciliter in 48 hours or increase in the creatinine 1.5 times of the baseline which is known or presumed to occur in the last 7 days. Or in terms of urine output, it's less than 0.5 ml per kg per hour for six hours or more. Now, why it is important to understand the definition of AKI? Patients who survive AKI are at also also at a risk of uh, increased long term morbidity, and that appears to be related to the severity of the AKI itself. Now, what is the renal replacement therapy? So basically, uh, it replaces the non endocrine uh, kidney function in the patients with the renal failure. Uh, the technique in the renal replacement therapies include uh, intermittent hemodialysis, continuous hemofiltration, and hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. So in terms of uh, intermittent uh, renal replacement therapy, it can be ISD that is intermittent hemodialysis or isolated ultrafiltration. It can be SLED or uh, it can be uh, CVV, HD, CVV, HF, the uh, abbreviations itself that explain the names. Uh, CVV is central venovenous and the H represents for the hemodialysis. HF uh, stands for the hemofiltration and HDF stands for the hemodiafiltration. The aim of renal replacement therapy are uh, solutes and water removal, correction of the electrolyte abnormalities and normalization of the acid-base disturbances. So this is achieved via diffusion or convection which is respectively referred as the hemodialysis or hemofiltration. What are the basic principles of the renal replacement therapy? It includes a diffusion, ultrafiltration, and convection. Uh, before going for the renal replacement therapy, you should be knowing what molecules you are targeting. So basically, there, can, there are three types of uh, molecules depending on their molecular weight. So small molecules like a urea, creatinine, phosphate, the range is approximately up to 500 kilodalton. The middle molecules are like vitamin B12, the drugs like vancomycin, endotoxin, ranging from 500 to 15,000. And those large molecules with the molecular weight more than 15,000 kilodaltons are like uh, albumin, myoglobulin, uh, and EBO. So something uh, regarding the renal replacement therapy membranes, there are two types of membranes uh, like cellulose-based and synthetic, uh, synthetic membranes. Cellulose-based membranes are uh, basically uh, likely to cause some inflammatory reactions. So those are considered a little inferior to the synthetic uh, 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 membranes. The exposure to an extracorporeal circuit and the interac uh, interaction between the blood and the membrane, it's known as the biocompatibility. So uh, the synthetic uh, membranes are more biocompatible and they are considered better for the renal replacement therapy. Now, uh, we do need a uh, filter fluids for the uh, renal replacement therapy. Uh, during hemofiltration, uh, bicarbonate ions are freely filtered and therefore they need to be replaced. So there are two types of uh, fluids uh, which are uh, one are bicarbonate based and other are lactate based. 
So lactate based solutions have got more complications and risk of lactic acidosis. So bicarbonate based uh, fluids are more preferred. So it can be added as a pre dilutional replacement or the post dilutional replacement fluid. Uh, the pre dilutional replacement uh, fluid reduces incidence of uh, filter clotting and it reduces the effective clearance of the solutes. Whereas the post dilution replacement is ideal, but it commonly is often made to maintain the integrity and lifespan of the uh, filter. Uh, there is a good chance of clotting of the circuit with the uh, post dilution replacement fluids. Then, uh, what can be the indications for the renal replacement therapy in the patient with the shock or septic shock? It can be a refractory hyperkalemia, a refractory acidosis with the pH less than 7.2, anuria, uremic complications like encephalopathy, pericarditis, and drug toxicity. Now, what are the advantages and disadvantages with the renal replacement therapy? The advantages include it's a better hemodynamic stability. It's a slow and predictable uh, volume uh, removal, that is UF removal is there. Alterations in the disease control by cytokine removal, especially in case of a hemofiltration is there. And there is better preservation of the cerebral perfusion among the patients with the acute brain injury or fulminant hepatic failure. The disadvantages of the cons, most importantly, is the cost. It is a costly modality and it do need a special equipment and the fluids for the management. Now coming to the CRRT prescription, uh, we need to highlight some of the uh, basic things in the CRRT prescription. It includes the access, the mode which you want to use, the dose, uh, blood flow, replacement in case of uh, uh, hemofiltration, anticoagulation and the ultrafiltration itself. So this is the classic uh, screen of the CRRT machine, what it looks like. If you look at the right corner, it has uh, depicted the uh, mode that is CVV HDF. It includes, uh, it indicates the central venovenous. HDF stands for the hemodiafiltration. The access is mentioned, the filter effluent. <laughs> then uh, on the left side of the screen, you can see the rate with which the blood is withdrawn from the patient, the dialyzer itself, the replacement, uh, the effluent fluid, and uh, everything in detail is mentioned on this prescription. Then regarding the catheter selection, the catheter should be of sufficient gauge, uh, usually 13 fridge or 13.5 fridge, what we use. Uh, it, it helps to deliver the desired blood flow rate without uh, high or negative pressure. The catheter function is best in the right internal jugular vein, followed by the femoral vein and the left internal jugular vein. So, uh, position yeah. of the catheter tip is wow. moved. Uh, the position of the catheter Somebody's uh, mic is uh, on. Uh, kindly uh, mute. mute your mic, please. So, position of the catheter tip is more important than the access itself. Uh, optimal flows are better obtained when the catheter tip is uh, lying in the atrium, uh, most importantly mid atrium for the IJV and uh, with the femoral axis, the tip should be lying in the uh, inferior vena cava. Now these are the different modes which are used for the uh, CRRT uh, or renal replacement therapy. Now uh, regarding the dosing of the uh, CRRT, uh, it is a, a proven fact that uh, CRT dose is essentially quantified by the effluent flow and there is no survival benefit if you exceed the dose more than 20 to 25 ml per kg per hour. So usually the prescribed an uh, effluent flow rate of 30 ml per kg is used to achieve a delivery dose of almost 25 ml per kg per hour. Patients with the severe metabolic derangements may benefit with the higher doses of the CRRT. So you can manipulate the dose depending on the clinical condition of the patient, the hemodynamics. Then regarding the blood flow rate, uh, it is the rate with which the blood is withdrawn, actually withdrawn from the patient's body. So usually it is started at 75 to 100 ml per minute as, and it, it depends on the tolerance of the patient, depending on the clinical condition, <laughs> ongoing uh, inotropes and the uh, volume status of the patient. You also need to have the replacement fluid for a hemofiltration purpose basically. So it can be given as a pre or a post dialyzer and the unit is always in the uh, ml per hour and the dilated is a fluid which is uh, coming uh, which is a mixture of actually the one which is removed from the patient and the uh, 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 replacement fluid uh, combined it is with the dilated so the total dilated plus the replacement is known as the effluent dose 
Can you find out whose mic is on, Arinda? Can we request them to mute, please? Yeah. Sudeshna, can you please mute? So, sorry for the interruption. So, we need to have some anticoagulation uh, while doing the renal replacement therapy. There are two types of anticoagulants uh, which we use. Uh, one is the systemic uh, anticoagulant and one is the original anticoagulant. So, systemic heparin anticoagulation is most commonly used anticoagulation. But the balance between the risk of bleeding and clotting, uh, clotting has to be addressed. <laughs> In case of a uh, regional anticoagulation, the citrate is the uh, uh, better choice. Uh, the citrate, the side effect with the citrate is that it chelates the calcium and inhibits the platelet aggregation and coagulation. So, because of the majority of the citrate calcium complex is removed in the uh, dialysis during the fusion, a systemic calcium infusion has to be maintained to avoid the hypocalcemia. And there are potential side effects with the uh, citrate anticoagulation. This includes alkalosis, which is conversion of citrate to the bicarbonate, acidosis due to citrate accumulation itself, hypocalcemia, and hypomagnesemia which is attributed to uh, binding with the citrate and calcium complex. Then uh, fluid balance. Uh, the fluid balance during the acute kidney injury is also associated with the decreased likelihood of the renal recovery. Uh, we can use the beds with the inbuilt scales, which can allow for training the patient's weight scale uh, during the RRD treatments. And uh, scuff as a form of renal replacement therapy can be used for patients with the uh, whose primary uh, pathology is the volume overload. In ultrafiltration, it depends on the patient, uh, patient's volume st status. Uh, classically, we usually start depending on the patient's tolerance. Then uh, while ongoing this uh, 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 renal replacement therapy, we have to monitor certain things, which includes the uh, uh, metabolic parameters, the electrolyte correction. So uh, four to six hourly, we can go for uh, uh, checking uh, the arterial blood gases and electrolytes to, uh, to see the improvement in the acidosis, uh, hyperkalemia, or alkalosis. Then a pro prolonged CRRT may need to replace the potassium also. Uh, with the, If the CRRT lasts for more than uh, 48 hours, there can be chance of hypophosphatemia. So phosphorus level has also to be uh, uh, checked and replaced. And also calcium levels need to be uh, checked and replaced. Now, uh, drug dosing in the renal replacement therapy. Uh, so many drug, uh, many disease uh, itself can affect the pharmacokinetics and uh, pharmacodynamics of the drug, and these are altered during the disease process itself. So drugs with the low protein binding are uh, removed by the CRRT uh, more easily, uh, whereas those with the higher volume of distribution have low clearance with the CRRT. The mechanical processes of CRRT may also affect the drug clearance. Changes to the dialysate or blood flow rate altering the transmembrane pressure can lead to changes in the drug clearance. So if you have a uh, membrane with the larger pore, uh, it is directly proportional to the degree of uh, drug removal by the CRRT itself. So coming to the uh, routinely used drugs in the ICU settings or critical care settings, so beta-lactam antibiotics uh, require to be kept above the uh, minimal inhibitory concentration. It can be dosed either more frequently or close to normal dose to achieve the maximal benefit. Uh, regarding antifungals, such as the fluconazole, uh, it undergoes a significant tubular reabsorption and therefore the uh, therefore it undergoes the greater clearance with the CRRT and require dosing adjustment uh, in case of a ongoing CRRT. Drugs such as vancomycin with the narrow uh, therapeutic indices need much regular monitoring and benefit from the delivery by the continuous infusion to avoid the rapid clearance of the overdosing. Now strategies, so just like I uh, started, uh, you need to know what molecules you are targeting before you start the renal replacement therapy. So dialysis itself targets the small molecules and the filtration uh, targets the middle sized molecules. So if you see at the uh, pathology cascade, uh, the pathogens 
can uh, lead to pathogen associated molecular patterns and uh, it leads to tissue damage and there is a damage associated molecular pattern which again uh, uh, leads to pattern recognition receptor the activation of innate immunity and the uncontrolled inflammation so there you can use uh, different kind of filters to stop this so idea of the uh, renal replacement therapy is to take over the function of the kidney, but uh, this is not sufficient in cases of a, a septic shock or refractory shock where different inflammatory mediators and cytokines are playing the role and deteriorating the patient. So if you can add any filter which can take out these things along with the renal replacement therapy, that will be a, a beneficial thing. So these filters are coming with uh, this idea only. So cytokine theory suggests that the renal replacement therapy with a, a special filter affects the immune function by regulating monocytes, neutrophils and lymphocytes at the cellular level, having effect on the leukocytes and also the bacterial clearance. Another hypothesis is removal of the cytokines and inflammatory mediators to reduce the burden and help the uh, improving the shock. So different filters uh, are coming more, more frequently used are uh, hemofiltration, which uh, helps to remove uh, the inflammatory mediators. Uh, so sorry, the inflammatory mediators are water soluble and the molecular weight is less than 60 kilo Dalton. And thus they can be effectively removed from the plasma via the convection method. So for targeting these molecules, you will be using the hemofiltration. Uh, then uh, uh, dis uh, disposable hemodiabsorption cartridge with the adsorbent material made up of neutral microporous uh, resin and coating are used. It removes the middle to large pathogenic substances from the blood and uh, frequently used uh, 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 membrane is HA380 absorber. So for small molecules, hemofiltration, middle molecules, HA380 adsorber and uh, cytosorb or hemo uh, adsorber, uh, it is, it's a, a, a better variety or a, a advanced filter you may say. Uh, this device is made up of a biocompatible as well as uh, hemocompatible uh, polystyrene divinyl benzene copolymer beads. It is designed to uh, remove the excess inflammatory cytokines from the blood like interleukin 1b, interleukin 1c, 8, 10, the monomer, uh, tumor necrotic factor alpha, uh, trimer, and interferon uh, gamma. It has a surface area of more than uh, 45,000 meters square. So in principle, it has got a far greater capacity for adsorption than with the dialyzer or the hemofiltration. And the size selective removal of the hydrophobic substance with the uh, more cutoff of the 60 kilo Dalton is helpful, thus resulting in the adsorption of both pro-inflammatory mediators, toxin and the drugs. However, the endotoxins uh, are an exception as their molecular, uh, molecular weight is 100 kilo Daltons. So this therapy can be helpful for 24 hours and after that the filter needs to be changed. Now removal and reduction of the endotoxin helps in the reducing the inflammatory, uh, inflammatory mediators. So uh, uh, with the help of a polymixin B, it's a immobilized fiber column. It has been extensively used for endotoxin removal. These are uh, uh, newer filters. And polymixin B is a cationic antibiotic which uh, uh, binds endotoxin and uh, neutralizes the toxicity. And the second one is the combined endotoxin and cytokine removal. That is auxiliary membrane uh, filter. It is modified uh, AN16 and ST membrane, which has an affinity to absorb both endotoxin and the cytokines. The duration of this filter is up to 72 hours. Now, uh, when to discontinue the CRRT? So, uh, uh, renal replacement therapy is usually until, uh, continued until the patient shows the evidence of uh, uh, recovery from the native uh, renal function. Uh, urine output of more than 400 ml per day is a reasonable uh, value to uh, identify the correction of the primary pathology. Uh, recovery you, uh, may also be uh, uh, judged with the help of a decline in the creatinine or uh, with the uh, steady uh, trends of the creatinine or declining uh, creatinine trend, you can uh, come to the conclusion that the patient is recovering. A more objective assessment of the recovery is obtained by the measurement of the clear creatinine uh, clearance itself. Now, development of the CKD, uh, it's, it's uh, like uh, among uh, most of the survivors of the uh, acute kidney injury, a good proportion of the patient becomes a uh, dialysis dependent and they become a chronic uh, kidney disease patient. A further subset of patients recovering from AKI never return uh, the uh, baseline to the baseline uh, creatinine or uh, renal function. So ongoing evidence of the renal dysfunction been described as almost as 40% of the survivors of the AKI may land up into CKD. So indeed the more severe AKI, the greater is the chance to land up into the uh, chronic kidney disease. So a better uh, follow up with the nephrology team is advised. Thank you very much.
very difficult uh, we both couldn't understand the question if anyone else yeah. can am i audible now yes sir much better, better huh? yeah manage better now yeah okay so listen uh what i was asking is when i look at refractory shock management now from a nephrology perspective it's basically that uh, there is a standard role for a nephrologist like you know when you come when you have a patient with a refractory shock, most of it is septic. And even the small component, which is non-septic, nephrologist role is fairly standard. You come, you look for AKI, you look for volume, you look for acidosis, you look for electrolyte imbalance, <coughs> and you do a dialysis when required, and you choose a dialysis modality based on the hemodynamic stability of the patient. Correct? Yes. But more than that, uh, what is changing is that this kind of a conventional role of the nephrologist, the uh, mortality is far higher than what can be accepted as than acceptable in refractory shock. And that is why uh, there is a need for newer therapies in this uh, care of these patients. So that is what needs to come out. When you do a presentation on refractory shock, na, it is important to understand that there is a era before and after so once you talk about newer therapies you're basically talking about uh, two or three things Wo most important you're talking about adsorption techniques which you covered nicely the second you're talking about uh, hemofiltration convective clearance so i don't know if i was on the phone for some time or what but did you cover the ronco trial uh, no, sir. No, sir. Yeah, because I think it is very important for us yes. to understand why, where this hemofiltration thing came up from and what was the for and against it. Because high volume hemofiltration uh, has its role, but it is again very debatable. And uh, the last is coupled uh, plasma filtration with adsorption. So these are the three modalities from the nephrology perspective in addition to most the organ support techniques that you are talking about when you do uh, dialysis in the current era. And how do you choose between the different filters is what I was trying to learn from your talk. So any thoughts on those you want to share with all of us? So How do you choose which filter to use for which patient? So depending on the uh, size of the molecule and the primary pathology, uh, depending on the size, of, uh, just like I told you, for uh, small size molecules, there are different filters. And uh, in case of a septic shock, where you want to remove the uh, mediators of inflammation along with these uh, molecules, filters like uh, cytosol and all uh, can be used, sir. No, no, no. So we, for the small size molecules, which filter do you want to use? So, so give me like an example a, of a uh, small size molecule. Uh, mediators and... No, which molecule are we talking about? Give me one or two names. Uh, sir. I have mentioned all the molecules here. Right. Tell me the small size molecules that you want to remove. Like sir, urea and creatinine, sir. Less than uh, 500 so kilodaltons. Urea and creatinine. <clears throat> that parts of conventional treatment, right? That's what I was telling you. Yes, sir. That when you speak of refractory shock management in today's time, you, you have a conventional treatment and you have a newer modalities. Right? So when you're talking conventional, don't mix the two. Conventional treatment is the same that was there 25 years back when I was training. In 1998, when I joined nephrology, this was the same treatment available. 
Okay. So that's what I was trying to tell you that in your presentation, you should have divided into two uh, groups. One is a conventional treatment that you must do because it is time tested, which includes removal of urea and creatine with a regular dialyzer. So when we did the topic on dialyzers, if you were there, you must have heard that we have different types of dialyzers. We have cellulose dial acetate is the commonest, the polysulfone dialyzers and you know, um, acrylon nitrile, and then we have high flux dialysis, which high flux means basically size more size yes, molecules can be removed, right? So that is all part of conventional dialysis yes, techniques. Sir. But conventional dialysis is not we are aiming for. We are looking at uh, removing uh, cytokines. We are looking at removing middle molecules. And the measurable cytokines is what I was expecting from you. Because, you know, you have these things. You have hemophile, you have oxyris, you have cytosob. So the question was, how do you choose between these uh, different uh, dialyze, the adsorptive filters that you have? Which one are you going to use in which setting? Do you have any idea on that? Uh, no, sir, I would like to. Yeah, because see, there are some filters uh, which uh, are specific. Like when you use a uh, Tore, Toramixin, right? You know that you are using a filter to bind lipopolysaccharide, uh, which is present on the surface of gram negative SLI primarily. So if you have an endotoxin assay and your assay is positive, and that's what we are doing now. That's what the new protocol in our ICU is about. That in the first hour of shock, we are supposed to send an IL-6 and an LPS. And once it becomes commonplace, we'll be doing it for all the patients. Endotoxin activity. We have, this, uh, we have the endotoxin assay. If the endotoxin assay is positive, preferentially, we'll go for Tore. Okay, sir. Because you have something measurable that you're binding against. <laughs> Whereas if we feel it's more of a cytokine storm and less of a uh, endotoxic shock, then cytosol holds the gold standard for now. We can choose uh, the remaining two filters with oxyris and hemophil. The advantage is that it doubles up as a dialysis cartridge as well as a filter. So if you have seen them on when they are working, you see there is only one filter attached to the machine, not two filters. Whereas when you have cytosol going, you have two filters in series. You guys have noticed that, right? Yes, sir. Yeah, so they mix double up as both hemodialysis cartridge as well as uh, more, so more like a high flux kind of a thing, but much, much higher because you are effectively removing molecules up to 5000 Ka, right? Yes. yes. So basically, <clears throat> uh, removal is one part of the story. Now, always the debate has been that how do you know what you are removing and whether it is beneficial or harmful? Because, you know, you, you want to remove cytokines. But mm. when the body is going through a shock, body is having both excess of good and bad cytokines. Bad mm. because they are hurting and good because they are trying to increase the good ones so that they can come out and fight the bad ones. So will yes. you do good or bad when you remove the cytokines? And that debate still remains. And that is why there is no universal adoption of these filters. So you need to know why they are not being universally adopted yet. It is because we don't know whether we are doing good or bad when you remove cytokines in septic shock. <coughs> Some people do recover, right? Without use of these filters. Yes, yes. So how do they recover? Hmm. They recover because the body's system takes over and the good cytokines overpower the bad ones ultimately. Yes. But if you are just removing then you will remove the good also. Yes, sir. So this is what we are still trying to learn. Which point to say yes to the filter, which point to say no to the filter. So IL-6 is a measurable cytokine, which we have learned in the COVID particularly, that if we use, if we remove, if we have a measurable cytokine, which we know is uh, responsible for the shock, and we are able to remove it, then maybe we can alter the response in the cytokine storm. Yes. That is why we need to measure them before starting the filter and at the end of the filter so that we will have data to say whether we have done the right thing. Because our intention was right, but did we do achieve the right thing? 
that's one thing then there are some indications for cytosol which are like now time tested like rhabdomyolysis dengue <clears throat> shock syndrome where now it is becoming standard of care slowly so all this is there so there are some indications now where you know rhabdomyolysis with uh, shock you would want to start a cytosol in the first hour because there is a mortality benefit to it hmm. okay so uh, there is a lot to learn uh, how about the filters it is still quite uh, uh, evolving area so we have to learn when to use the filter how to choose between the different filters when to say no you need for a filter okay it's not at every patient you're going to put an adsorptive filter and hope that it will do the magic mm. so timing of filter is important duration of filter is important <coughs> how to choose between different filters is important and when not to use a filter is also equally important yes and high volume hemo filtration the again the problem is the same that what are you achieving you are removing cytokines how do you know you are not removing the good ones because you are mm -hmm. just using filtration to remove everything so the whole debate comes around to what can you measure and till the labs give us measurable levels of good and bad cytokines available in a short turn around time it will be hard to justify using the filters universally like for us we can get a lps and a il6 in an r when we request for yes so we can use it but where you don't have the facility to to get the, them around in an hour will they be able to use it equally confidently yes right they wouldn't be able to use it and say that they did a good job because they are not able to measure them yes so that was one important thing to bring out so refractory shock na At, uh, so this is about the cartridge the other important thing that you were discussing was uh, the discussion should be which modality of dialysis to use. so timing of initiation of dialysis is a very crucial question in these patients <laughs> second is which modality of dialysis to choose so did you cover both of these things properly uh, yes sir okay so any final words on how, when to initiate dialysis absolute indications apart Mm. early or late or so there is a debate between starting uh, early or late so uh, most of the uh, literature supports that uh, it's more uh, more uh, of a clinical decision uh, to initiate the uh, renal replacement therapy see we went through the three trials right we went through the the start aki the elaine and the akiki trials so these are the three important trials Elaine. to decide early versus late initiation of dialysis in aki are you aware of all the three trials uh, no sir no i am not so aware please go and it. read read elaine trial e l a i n e hey. elaine trial akiki trial a k i k i and start aki s t a r t a k i okay sir read all the three trials and in the next part of your presentation cover them Okay. because you need to know when to initiate trials and what is the uh, when to initiate dialysis and what is the data as of now okay, okay. okay. so then you can decide uh, <clears throat> so uh, it remains a gray area i agree because you know you called two or three nephrologists and even they might not agree when to initiate they could all. so my own gut feeling is this that if i feel that the aki is likely to be prolonged i start early if i feel that the aki is not likely to be prolonged i would wait okay so, so at least a measurable parameters we should be able to discuss how do you decide which aki is likely to be prolonged and how do you decide which aki is likely to recover fast okay sir and that is again something that we are all having to learn how to put it objectively because there is a difference of opinion between different nephrologists because it is not exactly measurable what i am telling you which aki okay. will recover fast and which aki will recover late okay that is one of the reasons why people start the delay the initiation of dialysis or start it early so okay. hard indications is like non debatable everybody would start dialysis at that point 
Sir, we yeah. have certain questions. And then the other oh, sorry, sorry. I thought yeah. it's a name. Now you carry on. Then go ahead, go ahead, I no, no so... I was saying the only other last point that I was wanting him to think and elaborate upon was hmm. how do you choose between the different modalities of dialysis in a conventional setting? Yes. yes, sir. When to switch from IHD to SLED to CRRT and when to de-escalate from CRRT to SLED to yes, IHD. Sir. Yes. Like right now we had a patient in 1314, Shahida, right? We yes. shifted her to the wards. Yes. So how did we decide that she should be on CRRT or SLED? And how did we take her off SLED and uh, try to increase the duration between the two dialysis sessions? And finally, when did we decide that it's time to start a diuretic trial? Hmm. Like today she has managed to pass three liters of urine mm -hmm. on a diuretic trial. Right? So <clears throat> I think if you put a real world case, that is actually happening in our ICU when you are doing the presentation, most of you would have seen that patient at some point. Right? Yes. yes. So then that will be easier for all of you to understand what to, how to actually manage the patient. Suppose if you are the one taking the call, what will you do? Yes. Take real world cases when you are discussing all these four sessions that are in them as put forth for the month. Just go through those in that fashion. Then it will become more productive for you. So I know you had some questions you said. Yes. Uh, sir, can we, uh, if you allow, I think Dr. Dash has also joined. So both of you can take some certain quick fire questions for the benefit of the, the participants over here. Uh, the first of all, sir, if we need to write as you actually write so uh, some of our uh, residents fellows they wish to write a prescription for a so what are the points and if i ask you that what should be the 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 fill in the blanks so for example mode if this is a refractory septic shock so the mode would be on a crrt with a convective flow right mode air filtration so like that like that Sorry, I had a call, so I was kind of sorry, for sorry. a sorry. second. Sorry, I'm yeah. I'm just discussing for the benefit of the uh, the uh, the residents and fellows and all others. If I if we need to write a prescription for a mm -hmm. renal replacement therapy for a patient on a standard on a refractory shock. So if I ask you the questions, so for their benefit, can you please fill in the blanks that. If I start on with I that, think, yeah, yeah, please. Board. I think it's a good, it's a good thought, Arindam. It's a nice way of bringing forth the issues that are relevant to the residents. Go ahead, yes. please. So, what would be the mode? See, basically, I this is a case where instead of doing plain dialysis diffusion, you would want something of combination of diffusion and convection. Right. So it would be a hemodia filtration. So both you take the convective as well as uh, the, uh, and 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 diffusion. because see most of the refractory shock is because of sepsis, right? So it would make sense to have convective clearance added on because we do know that up to a convective clearance of twenty five ml per kg per hour, there is a mortality benefit in adding the convective clearance. Right, sir. What should be the uh, modality? Whether it should be a continuous. Or today, as we have seen that uh, many of you are actually in, uh, uh, sort of deploying a prolonged intermittent therapy or an extended sled, which one would be you choosing? So, see, extended sled is not really in the literature. Extended sled is CRT minus convection, but with a lot of diffusion clearance. So, I'll just join you in a second. Ah, uh, Rindam. Ah, boss. Yeah. So, uh, I'll just add to what Rushi said about the mode, mode you initially told na, us that uh, what will be the mode. So, uh, if it is a, let us say, case scenario based approach, let us say that the patient is having hyperkalemia. 
Okay, along with acidosis, along with Sick. septic shock. Rushi, I'm just taking over for a few minutes. When yeah, you yeah, please. Busy. Any most welcome. Thanks, Sudhir. Yeah. Please go ahead. I sorry, okay. I had that call from the ICU, 14th floor, about some patients. So, okay. anyways, continue, so, please. Let us say that I am. Uh, we are experiencing a patient with hyperkalemia. Then the best way will be to decrease the potassium as quickly as possible. And we know that the CBBA's CRRT is not a good uh, modality where the uh, potassium level is very slow to decline. Okay. So in that scenario, uh, what my approach will be, I don't know about the other people, but my approach will be to start with CBBSD, where by diffusion, I am taking out the potassium and trying to maximize the potassium clearance and just and whatever the acidosis part is there that will be corrected along with potassium so when you are basically doing the cbbhd you are uh, expecting that your with the bicarbonate what you are giving is that will be a alkalosis will be created and the potassium will move inside the cell which is much more important and taking out the potassium from the through dialysis is another aspect which with the slow flow itself is little bit compromised. So that's why uh, it will be probably a case scenario best rather than uh, taking into account a blanket statement that we have to do a dialysis, we have to do a, a convection clearance or a, a, a or a uh, diffusion clearance so or both so if let us say that the patient is having more of cytokine related then it will, you will be much more beneficial benefited with uh, convective clearance and mm -hmm. additional uh, uh, cartridges like cytosol or auxiliaries or whatever you want to do so in that scenario i think so first and foremost, we have to see what is the scenario over there and then decide what modality we, mode we are choosing. And this is an example, just it is an example. Then, then the other thing what uh, is needed to understand is the uh, many of the times uh, when the patient comes to the in shock, uh, basically with multi uh, uh, organ dysfunction syndrome, the uh, coagulation profile also got derased. There is a consumption, coagulopathy, all those things. So in that scenario, heparin cannot be used. And if there is a liver... Uh, uh, regarding liver, the, the choice... Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Reg uh, if there no, is no, a no please carry on. I thought you, you finished off. Oh, okay. So uh, if there is a shock liver, it is also difficult that the citrate will be converted to bicarbonate. So we had to uh, see other uh, aspects like what you said, regional anti, uh, citrate anticoagulant sometimes can be counterproductive also. As you, the uh, Danish had say, said that that can produce cit citrate related, hypercitrate related cytotoxicity, uh, uh, sorry, acidosis, and uh, hypocalcemia even. Yes. Although calcium we can correct by giving calcium chloride, but uh, the citrate will not be converted to bicarbonate if the liver function is deranged. So there we have a, a measure, measuring uh, option of citrate gap. So if you do a citrate gap and see that the citrate gap is higher than the normal, two to three times higher, three times more than the uh, level, then you have to curtail in citrate uh, infusion and adjust it accordingly. So that is one point I wanted to make. Yeah, Arindam, up to you now. Uh, the next question is whether it's a continuous process or we can, uh, as Rushi sir was talking about it, whether we can do an extended sled. Not only sled, but an extended sled. Yes. It is, it is like this, that dialysis 
in this kind of a refractory shock setting should be a continuous therapy. Now, when you do a continuous therapy, you have two options. You can do a, what we do is kind of, you know, a CRRT is definitely the preferred standard of care. But in cost uh, constraint settings, we can do a sled and just prolong the sled uh, for an indefinite period of time, which sometimes we do and run it almost like a CRRT. Hmm. So now I have a question for the residents. And I want if it's a volunteering thing. Anybody can answer. What is the difference between extended sled and CRI? Anybody? I think many people are here. I can see. I can ask. Uh, Any Pradeep, volunteers? Pradeep, Shital, Reshma. To answer, I think Chandrima has written something in the chat. Chandrima, go ahead answer. Chandrima asked a question. <laughs> okay, we have a first question for you, then we will go back to it. Yeah, first we'll, we'll ask her our question, then we can answer hers. Yes. Chandrima, you're ready? Go ahead, Chandrima. Yeah. So, sir, my question was actually based on. No, no, no. You have to answer our question yes, first, and then we'll take you. We have to answer. <laughs> but I think the blood flow is slightly different in extended sled and CRRT. No, it is the same. It's same. Any then about the same. convective I think clearance, just there told is a few minutes before. Convective clearance is uh, difference. E. What is convective clearance difference? Jara elaborate karo, please. Uh, like in uh, in case of. Uh, uh, like in case of severe uh, lactic acidosis or in case of uh, when we want to remove large molecules, we can increase the uh, wait now. We can increase the blood flow and the dialysis flow in the CRRT blood machine. Blood flow is the same. Uh, sorry, blood not blood flow. Sorry, dialysis and substitute so can no increase. Sorry, what can it increase? Dialysis and substitute, we can increase. Dialysis is much more in, in sled than in CRRT, you are aware, right? Yes. Sir. Do you know how much dialysis is there in a sled? 3000. Wrong. 3, the minimum dialysis you use is 300 ml per minute or 500 ml per minute huh. in a sled. So, huh. how much will that be in an hour? 18 liters to 18 30 liters. liters. Yes. Hmm. Right. And how much dialysis do you use in a CRRT? Uh, we start with 1000 milliliter per minute. Exactly. So, huh. per minute? Sorry, sir. 1000 milliliter per hour. Exactly. Huh. Can't raise you. Paytm try. <coughs> Understand? Okay. Huh, sir. Yes. So, uh, where is the question of increasing uh, dialysis then? It is 1 liter versus 18 liters or 1 liter versus 30 liters. Yes. So long sled is a far better dialysis technique than mm. CRRT. Okay. Correct? Mm. So what is it that you achieve? Uh, how do you add convective clearance in CRRT? What do you do? Mm -hmm. What so is replacement, Chandrima? Uh, sir, replacement is uh, the amount that we pre-filter and post-filter fluid may we add and uh, then we try to replace the metabolites which we are taking out and we try to replace it with a replacement fluid. <clears throat> okay, anybody else wants to volunteer? What is replacement fluid? Any of the residents? No, 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 no. What is what is replacement? There can be done. Yeah, we Okay. Any of the nephrology senior residents? I can see some of them there. The replacement fluid is the uh, same as such substitution fluid that we replace. Uh, once we have removed uh, the fluid during convective clearance to maintain the hemodynamics, if we are doing convective clearance of one liter, we remove that fluid 
and then we'll have to return the fluid to make it the hemodynamic stability of the patient. We want that, that much amount of fluid to be removed to ensure uh, clearance using sol your solvent drag, but we'll have to return that much fluid. So what we return is a replacement. Can be given pre right. so or post. Yeah, so basically what Rajita is saying is, to achieve convective clearance, you remove, you cannot achieve convection without removing the solvent. You have to remove the solute, right? So when you remove an excess amount of solute, you will cause hemodynamic instability. Hmm. So you have to replace that. And that is what the replacement fluid is. So whether you call it a substitution fluid or the replacement fluid, effectively you are replacing the amount that you have ultra filtered. Hmm. Except in ultra filtration, when you say it is because of a pressure difference that is ultra filtration whereas when you remove because the pore size is bigger you basically remove the solute and the solvent drags with it okay. so there you want to explain for a simple language man okay so it is like this that uh, when uh, what is diffusion and convection that has been already elaborated correct so when you are taking out solvent uh, that is a solvent drag that is water molecule you are taking out along with water molecule you are taking out the middle molecules or higher molecular substances so when you are taking out that, that com that is responsible for basically your osmotic balance in your body. So let us say that uh, in dialysis or the diffusion-based clearance versus the uh, uh, convective clearance. So when you are talking about dialysis, why it is not possible to do in refractory shock is basically when you want to take out fluid along with the, uh, uh, the diffusing substance, especially the urea and other uh, substances, they contribute a lot uh, for the maintenance of your, uh, what you say, osmotically, uh, osmotic activity or the oncotic pressure in your blood. So as we as you is discussed that the dialysis process, if you are doing sled also, you are taking out almost 300 ml of per minute of uh, dialysate, and the diffusion is occurring across that. So it is a huge amount. So that's why most of the time the sled also may not be tolerated by the people who are in refractory uh, salt. Whereas in convective clearance we are not only taking out the middle molecules and the small molecules, but we are replacing with a isotonic fluid, which will maintain the your osmotic balance. Okay, so whatever you are giving, and you are taking out that much. So that is the concept of convective clearance, where middle molecules are taken out much more but it is in a continuous process, so the effect of uh, uh, intravascular volume depletion is less and the osmotic stability will be maintained. Am I a... Uh, I, mean, I think, I, I think, I think here, to oversimplify it, what we can say is whether it is ultrafiltration or whether it is convective fluid removal. Effectively, you are removing fluid. But yes. the processes by which it is removed is different. Hmm. Yes. Yeah. Replacement fluid is basically when we are giving it, we are balancing the, uh, so, uh, the intravascular compartment and we are reducing the chance of uh, and maintaining the osmotic gradient. So, which is much more essential in maintaining the blood pressure during the soft period. Since effective arterial blood volume is low in those group of patients, already vasodilated state may rest. Yes, sir. Uh, that is, uh, I think, uh, I don't know whether... Uh, uh, so, Chandima, I, I could... Could... What it is? 
Yes. Yeah. So that that is the difference, and in choosing the modality, right? So how do you choose between IHD, SLED, and CRIT? That was the discussion we were centering around, and the answer was that if you want convective clearance uh, and more hemodynamic stability, you choose CRIT, and if you want mm -hmm. To achieve rapid correction of say something like hyperkalemia or acidosis, you will actually be better served by a prolonged sled. Okay, sir. Because those things will be corrected by diffusion. And diffusion is better with sled as compared to CRIT. Okay. Sir. Okay? Yes. Sir. Questions? Any questions? I think Chandrima wants wanted to have some. <laughs> yeah, sorry questions. about that, Chandrima. That we, she wanted to we ask forgot a question. about our question. She got too many. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Ask your question now. <laughs> uh, sir, actually, I wanted to ask. Suppose uh, we have a case with severe lactic acidosis and refractory shock. The patient is on dual vasopressor support. Uh, we choose uh, a CRRT in this case as the modality uh, because the patient is hemodynamically unstable, right? So the mm -hmm. initial settings, we usually start as dilicet as 1000 milliliter per hour, substitute as 1000 milliliter per hour and blood flow is 100 milliliter per minute. This is the initial setting, sir. Then after some time, uh, we see that... Uh, uh, like if the acid, uh, uh, lactic acidosis is still on the higher side, uh, we increase the dialysate and substitute flow a little. But then uh, my question was, do we have to alter the blood flow also accordingly? And if we do that, uh, how do uh, how do we change it, sir? So effectively, what you're talking about is how to increase the efficiency of dialysis. Yes, sir. Correct. So the yes. modalities that you have in your hand in any mm. dialysis technique to increase mm. the efficiency of dialysis. If you increase the blood flow, it is directly mm. proportional increasing the efficiency of dialysis. Yes. If you increase the dialysis flow, it is directly proportional. Mm. Right. If you mm. have a, 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 a blood and dialysis flowing in the same direction, you reduce mm. the efficiency. If they are mm. flowing in opposite directions, it is maximizing the efficiency. Yes. Sir. Understand? So these are hmm. two, three simple things that you can do. So it is whenever you want to increase efficiency, you only have these things at your disposable. Now the point is that when you increase the blood flow, can the patient tolerate it hemodynamically? Uh, yes, because, sir. And that is the reason why in patients yeah. with say, a, a, you know, poor cardiac reserve or refractory shock on large doses of inotropes, yes. you are concerned at the outset to increase the blood flow. But as they are becoming Coming more stable, you can feel free to increase the blood flow. Hmm. To increase the efficiency of what you are doing. Hmm. Right? Okay. Yes, sir. Hmm. And lactate as such, you know, it is a difficult molecule because it hmm. is not removed by diffusion. Lactate yes, is not sir. a small molecule. Yes, so, con convective clearance is important when you are targeting oh. lactate. So now, chosen... whether you will benefit or not is hmm. also difficult to say because the rate of generation of lactate is always hmm. much more than the rate of removal. Hmm. So, unless the generation stops, you are not going to win. Okay. Actually, sir, in a book, I have those, read that the QB is to QD uh, ratio uh, has to be maintained around 5 is to 1. So, how far is that? That uh, is not to waste the dialysate. Okay. Because if you are increasing the QD to say 10 times what the QB is, hmm. then you are just wasting the dialysate because it is already cleared what had to be cleared in that 100 ml of blood flow. Okay. Sir. That's why that number. Okay. It is not a fixed uh, dose uh, like 1000 ml has to be given. It has to be a calculated dose according to the ideal weight, uh, body weight of the patient. So, it is customary that we start with a dose of around 25 ml per kg of uh, body, uh, means kg of ideal body weight per hour. 
एंड आपको इंक्रीज ऑफ टू फोर्टी एम एल पर के जी पर आवर तो दैट इज वॉट रूशी आस्ट यू दैट वेदर यू है ट्रायल ऑफ रोंको क्लॉडियो रोंको इट बेसिकली गिव्स यू एन आइडिया दैट हाई डोज वर्सेस लो डोज लो डोज डायलिस सी आर आर टी so whether it is efficient or efficient or not that is what they are. there there are lots of other Pressure things of so uh, the that yes, Ronco, claudio ronco's trial also has to be actually read by you all since these are some of the trials which are uh, uh, change uh, jo bolte hai na uh, ये चेंजिंग सिनारियो क्लिनिकल चेंज सिनारियो वेर यू हैव टू डिसाइड वेदर दोज आर एफ टू बी फॉलोड और नॉट यूनिवर्सली और नॉट सो दो ट्रायल्स हैज टू बी ऑल्सो रेड लाइक आई थिंक द बेस्ट वे विल बी टू कैटेगोराइज दैम राइट नाउ यू हैव डन ए समरीस ऑन CRRT in different and the trials of CRRT and what are the trials in USA? What are the trials in Canada? What are the trials in Italy? Uh, all the, Claudio Ronco is from Italy, so what are his suggestions? You can get those trials, and there is a great divide among the nephrologists from USA versus the Italian uh, nephrologists. Italian nephrologists are more in favor of convective clearance, and uh, the USA nephrologists are more in favor of diffusive clearance. So, uh, and they say that the high dose uh, uh, CRRT and beyond that, 40 ml, will not going to benefit the patient, and it is a futile attempt. Whereas. Claudio Ronco has said that higher the dose is better clearance with him convective clearance. Hmm. So there are certain always there will be a, a dilemma whom to choose and whom not to choose kind of thing. But you should read those trials. Okay. Arindam, any other questions? Yes. No, ma. I think uh, we would take the question on. Uh, uh, we would take this topic separately. One is how to write a dialysis prescription because it would require a lot of points to be one, two, three, four, five, so that our residents can very easily ask certain questions to you on the rounds and all other. So to clear their uh, doubts, we will take it separately and. regarding extra corporeal therapies that we can offer in sepsis as well as in other disease process we will have two separate class i think uh, next week uh, uh, rishab uh, actually volunteered to speak about green nephrology i think it, this is okay with both uh, you and rushi ji yeah yeah more than welcome Okay. Let us hear from Rishabh next week. Okay, so we will the next week uh, we will defer. Okay. We had certain lined up uh, 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 your programs, and uh, February we would be having our annual conference of critical care nephrology. So we would be announcing the program pretty soon, the dates and the programs. And uh, uh, so next week we are meeting on green nephrology, and I will request Dr. Rushi Deshpande. And also, Dr. Pandit and Dashra to finalize and fix the dates so that we can quickly announce the program. Sure. Okay. So thanks, Arindam. I'll take your leave. Thanks. Yes, sir. So Thank see you. you next week, all of you. Yeah. Bye. Uh, Arindam, I have a suggestion. Arindam, I have a suggestion. Yes, sir. So besides uh, seminars. i think uh, uh, it will be better idea to read a, a try uh, paper basically read a paper in the sense that critical assessment of a original article <laughs> 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 <laughs>
original article to be uh, critically uh, discussed. Okay, so what we will do is that I think that would be easier for the uh, uh, fellows also. You can give me choose the certain articles. We will ask them to do a critical appraisal of the article and also certain related articles, editorials and all that. We do it regularly for our critical care ray, uh, uh, topics. So I think it would be uh, quite apt and, and maybe more uh, beneficial to the fellows itself. Sir, kindly uh, give us a uh, 10, 12 good articles which are useful for both the subject of critical care as well as nephrology. And then we would start doing it. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone, for joining. See you next week, same time, Thursday, 7 p.m. in the evening. Thank you.